Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Very glad you're here. Good to see you. Uh, good to be here. And um, welcome to my comfy little corner of the internet. It's a humble little place where we uh, do a little drinking, a little thinking. So um, come join me if you will. I'd be honored if you would. And hopefully we learned something today that we didn't know yesterday. Bring what you got, of course, or nothing at all. I won't judge. But tonight I brought the Earl Grey, the trusty Earl Grey, and uh, seems like you just can't go wrong with it. So stick with what you got, right? Or with what you know. It's comfy that way, isn't it? So anyway, that being said, cheers to you and Jesus too. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking, as uh, as I often do, and you, for those of you who've been watching, you probably know I do because, uh, well, that's what we do on this show. Um, seems like the left is doing a lot of banning, right? You know, like I remember when they a couple months ago they banned Dr. Seuss, right? <laughs> Dr. Seuss. Um, some of his words weren't culturally sensitive or whatever they were, and it just cracks me up, you know, because. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Dr. Seuss was a leftist. You know, the man was a socialist. He swung that way, and uh, now he's getting banned by leftists, which <laughs> just goes to show you the revolution always eats its own. And to you current leftists, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to the day. It might be six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, who knows. But soon you all will be out of fashion and then the current bunch of leftists will be banning you so i eagerly look forward to that moment uh with anticipation and excitement and uh my funny bone is just just waiting for it so <laughs> anyway this whole thing got me thinking about banning books ideas stuff like like that and um <clears throat> Reminded me of a book that I read on this very topic. Um, I read it every now and then. It's a good book. It's called Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And it's a, a phenomenal book. Um, but I'm just going to share a quick little excerpt, little section here. Um, actually, I wouldn't go so far as to call it quick. It's a little longer than the ones I usually read, but I'll try and keep it quick. So... Um, like I said, I think you'll find it interesting. I hope it'll be worth your time. And, uh, yeah. Basically, mm, the setup, Fahrenheit 451, the, the main character, Montag, he's a fireman. But in firemen, they don't put out fires. And in this society, they, they start fires. They burn books. And uh, the scene is him in his house with his wife, Mildred. And uh, then his chief, fire chief, decides to show up for a nice little chat. Um, oh, I should mention that uh, Montag came into possession of one of the books, and he has yet to burn it. Spoiler alert. So, uh, anyway, I think you find it interesting. And, uh, yeah, let's dive right into it. Um, oh, one thing. I gotta say it, one thing, um, before I dive into it. Uh, this book uses a word. And I'm saying this for the YouTube censors and the outraged lefties. Um, the word is colored. All right. Now I'm asking you, please, okay, to give it some historical leniency. Back in the day, back in this book's time, and even before then, colored was a really was considered a polite way to refer to what we now refer to as African Americans or black people. And it was considered polite because, let's be honest, there was another word that was out there. <laughs> Not going to go there. But like I said, I ask that you give the book a little bit of historical leniency, okay? It was considered polite. If you'd said that term back then, nobody would have batted an eye. So I'm just asking you, it's considered offensive now. Just honestly, just chill, please. Chill, all right? And like I said earlier, six months from now, a year from now, ten years from now, you know, it's probably going to be considered offensive to call them African Americans. You'll be thrown in the leftist gulag. So, you know, what do you want? What do you want? All right, let's just calm down. <laughs> okay. All right. Mm. Okay. 
That being said, trigger warning, yippee. <laughs> let's, uh, let's dive into it, shall we? And the text reads a little something like this. Mildred said, Mildred is uh, the wife of the main character. Well, now you've done it. Out front of the house. Look who's here. I don't care. There's a Phoenix car just drove up, and a man in a black shirt with an orange snake stitched on his arm coming up the front walk. Captain Beatty, he said. Captain Beatty. Montag did not move, but stood looking into the cold whiteness of the wall immediately before him. Go let him in, will you? Tell him I'm sick. Tell him yourself. She ran a few steps this way, a few steps that, and stopped, eyes wide, when the front door speaker called her name, softly, softly. Miss Montag, Miss Montag, someone here, someone here. Miss Montag, Miss Montag, someone's here, fading. Montag made sure the book was well hidden behind the pillow, climbed slowly back into bed, arranged the covers over his knees and across his chest, half sitting, and after a while Mildred moved and went out of the room, and Captain Beatty strolled in, his hands in his pockets. "'Shut the relatives up,' said Beatty, looking around at everything except Montag and his wife. This time Mildred ran. The yammering voices stopped yelling in the parlor. Captain Beatty sat down in the most comfortable chair, with a peaceful look on his ruddy face. He took time to prepare and light his brass pipe and puff out a great smoke cloud. "'Just thought I'd come by and see how the sick man is.' How'd you guess? Beatty smiled his smile, which showed the candy pinkness of his gums and the tiny candy whiteness of his teeth. I've seen it all. You were going to call for a night off. Montag sat in bed. Well, said Beatty, take the night off. He examined his eternal matchbox, the lid of which said, Guaranteed, one million lights in this igniter, and began to strike the chemical match abstractedly, Blow out, strike, blow out, strike, speak a few words, blow out. He looked at the flame. He blew. He looked at the smoke. When will you be well? Tomorrow. The next day, maybe. First of the week. Beatty puffed his pipe. Every fireman, sooner or later, hits this. They only need understanding. To know how the wheels run. Need to know the history of our profession. They don't feed it to rookies like they used to. Damn shame. Puff. Only fire chiefs remember it now. Puff. I'll let you in on it. Mildred fidgeted. Beatty took a full minute to settle himself in and think back for what he wanted to say. When did it all start, you ask? This job of ours? How did it come about? Where? When? Well, I'd say it really got started around about a thing called the Civil War. Even though our rule book claims it was founded earlier, the fact is... We didn't get along well until photography came into its own. Then, motion pictures in the early 20th century. Radio, television, things began to have mass. Montag sat in bed, not moving. And because they had mass, they became simpler, said Beatty. Once, books appealed to a few people. Here, there, everywhere. They could afford to be different. The world was roomy. But then the world got full of eyes and elbows and mouths double, triple, quadruple population, films and radios, magazines, books leveled down to a sort of paste-pudding norm. Do you follow me? I think so. Beatty peered at the smoke pattern he had put out on the air. Picture it, 19th century man with his horses, dogs, carts, slow motion. Then, in the 20th century, speed up your camera. Books cut shorter, condensations, digests, tabloids, Everything boils down to the gag, the snap ending. Snap ending, Mildred nodded. Classics cut to fit 15-minute radio shows, then cut again to fill a two-minute book column, winding up at last as a 10- or 12-line dictionary resume. I exaggerate, of course. The dictionaries were for reference, but many were those whose sole knowledge of Hamlet, you know the title certainly, Montag, it is probably only a faint rumor of a title to you, Miss Montag, whose sole knowledge, as I say, of Hamlet was a one-page digest in a book that claimed, Now at last you can read all the classics. Keep up with your neighbors. Do you see? Out of the nursery, into the college, and back to the nursery, 
There's your intellectual pattern for the past five centuries or more. Mildred arose and began to move around the room, picking things up and putting them down. Beatty ignored her and continued. Speed up the film, Montag, quick. Click, pick, look, I, now, flick, here, there, swift, pace, up, down, in, out, why, how, who, what, where, a, eh, a, uh, bang, smack, wallop, bing, bong, boom, digest, 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 digests. Politics? One column. Two sentences. A headline. Then, in midair, all vanishes. Whirl man's mind around about so fast under the pumping hands of publishers, exploiters, broadcasters, that the centrifuge flings off all unnecessary time-wasting thought. Mildred smoothed the bedclothes. Montag felt his heart jump, and jump again as she patted his pillow. Right now, she was pulling at his shoulder to try to get him to move so she could take the pillow out and fix it nicely and put it back, and perhaps cry out and stare, or simply reach down her hand and say, What's this? And hold up the hidden book with touching innocence. School is shortened, discipline relaxed, philosophies, histories, languages dropped, English and spelling gradually, gradually neglected, finally almost completely ignored. Life is immediate. The job counts. Pleasure lies all about after work. Why learn anything, save pressing buttons, pulling switches, fitting nuts and bolts? Let me fix your pillow, said Mildred. No, whispered Montag. The zipper displaces the button, and the man lacks just that much time to think while dressing at dawn. A philosophical hour, and thus a melancholy hour. Mildred said, Here. Get away, said Montag. Life becomes one big pratfall, Montag. Everything bang, boff, and wow. Wow, said Mildred, yanking at the pillow. For God's sake, let me be, cried Montag passionately. Beatty opened his eyes wide. Mildred's hand had frozen behind the pillow. Her fingers were tracing the book's outline, and, as the shape became familiar, her face looked surprised, and then stunned. Her mouth opened to ask a question. Empty the theaters, save for clowns, and furnish the rooms with glass walls and pretty colors, running up and down the walls like confetti, or blood, or sherry, or sauterne. You like baseball, don't you, Montag? Baseball's a fine game. Now Beatty was almost invisible, a voice somewhere behind a screen of smoke. What's this? asked Mildred, almost with delight. Montag heaved back against her arms. What's this here? Sit down, Montag shouted. She jumped away, her hands empty. We're talking. Beatty went on as if nothing had happened. You like bowling, don't you, Montag? Bowling, yes. And golf? Golf is a fine game. Basketball, a fine game. Billiards, pool, football. Fine games, all of them. More sports for everyone, group spirit, fun, and you don't have to think, eh? Organize and organize and super organize, super super sports. More cartoons and books, more pictures. The mind drinks less and less. Impatience. Highways full of crowds going somewhere, 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 nowhere. The gasoline refugee. Towns turn into motels, people in nomadic surges from place to place, following the moon tides, living tonight in the room where you slept this noon and I the night before. Mildred went out of the room and slammed the door. The parlor ants began to laugh at the parlor uncles. Now let's take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? The bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers. Doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second-generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean. Authors full of evil thoughts. Lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla tapioca. Books, so the damned snobbish critics said, were dishwater. No wonder books stopped selling, the critics said. But the public, knowing what it wanted, spinning happily, let the comic books survive. And the three-dimensional sex magazines, of course. 
There you have it, Montag. It didn't come from government, down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship. To start with, no. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick, thank God. Today, thanks to them, you can stay happy all the time. You are allowed to read comics, the good old confessions, or trade journals. Yes, but what about the firemen then? asked Montag. Ah, Beatty leaned forward, in the faint mist of smoke from his pipe. What more easily explained and natural? With school turning out more runners, jumpers, racers, tinkerers, grabbers, snatchers, flyers, and swimmers, instead of examiners, critics, knowers, and imaginative creators, the word intellectual, of course, became the swear word it deserved to be. You always dread the unfamiliar. Surely you remember the boy in your own school class who was exceptionally bright, did most of the reciting and answering, while the others sat like so many leaden idols, hating him. And wasn't it this bright boy you selected for beatings and tortures after hours? Of course it was. We must all be alike. Not everyone born free and equal, as the Constitution says, but everyone made equal. Each man the image of every other. Then all are happy, for there are no mountains to make them cower, to judge themselves against. So, a book is a loaded gun in the house next door. Burn it. Take the shot from the weapon. For each man's mind. Who knows who might be the target of the well-read man? Me? I won't stomach them for a minute. And so, when houses were finally fireproofed completely, all over the world, you were correct in your assumption the other night, there was no longer need of firemen for the old purposes. They were given the new job as custodians of our peace of mind, the focus of our understandable and rightful dread of being inferior. Official censors, judges, and executors. That's you, Montag. And that's me. The door to the parlor opened, and Mildred stood there, looking in at them, looking at Beatty, and then at Montag. Behind her, the walls of the room were flooded with green and yellow and orange fireworks, sizzling and bursting to some music, composed almost completely of trap drums, tom-toms, and cymbals. Her mouth moved, and she was saying something, but the sound covered it. Beatty knocked his pipe into the palm of his pink hand, studied the ashes as if they were a symbol to be diagnosed, and searched for meaning. You must understand that our civilization is so vast that we can't have our minorities upset and stirred. Ask yourself, what do we want in this country above all? People want to be happy, isn't that right? Haven't you heard it all your life? I want to be happy, people say. Well, aren't they? Don't we keep them moving? Don't we give them fun? That's all we live for, isn't it? For pleasure, for titillation. And you must admit, our culture provides plenty of these. Yes. Montag could lip-read what Mildred was saying in the doorway. He tried not to look at her mouth, because then Beatty might turn and read what was there, too. Colored people don't like little black Sambo? Burn it. White people don't feel good about Uncle Tom's cabin? Burn it. Someone's written a book on tobacco and cancer of the lungs? The cigarette people are weeping? Burn the book. Serenity, Montag. Peace, Montag. Take your fight outside. Better yet, into the incinerator. Funerals are unhappy and pagan? Eliminate them, too. Five minutes after a person is dead, he's on his way to the big flu. The incinerators serviced by helicopters all over the country. Ten minutes after death, a man's a speck of black dust. Let's not quibble over individuals with memoriams. Forget them. Burn all. Burn everything. Fire is bright, and fire is clean. The fireworks died in the parlor behind Mildred. She had stopped talking at the same time. A miraculous coincidence. Montag held his breath. There was a girl next door, he said slowly. She's gone now. I think dead. I can't even remember her face. But she was different. How... how did she... happen? Beatty smiled. Here or there, that's bound to occur. Clarice McClellan? We've a record on her family. We've watched them carefully. Heredity and environment are funny things. You can't rid yourselves of all the odd ducks in just a few years. The home environment can undo a lot 
you try to do at school. That's why we've lowered the kindergarten age year after year, until now we're almost snatching them from the cradle. We had some false alarms on the McClellans, when they lived in Chicago. Never found a book. Uncle had a mixed record, antisocial. The girl? She was a time bomb. The family had been feeding her subconscious, I'm sure, from what I saw of her school record. She didn't want to know how a thing was done, but why? That can be embarrassing. You ask why to a lot of things, and you wind up very unhappy indeed if you keep at it. The poor girl's better off dead. Yes, dead. Luckily, queer ones like her don't happen often. We know how to nip most of them in the bud early. You can't build a house without nails and wood. If you don't want a house built, hide the nails and wood. If you don't want a man unhappy, politically, don't give him two sides to a question to worry him. Give him one. Better yet, give him none. Let him forget there is such a thing as war. If the government is inefficient, top-heavy, and tax-mad, better it be all those than that the people worry over it. Peace, Montag. Give the people contests they win by remembering the words to more popular songs, or the names of state capitals, or how much corn Iowa grew last year. Cram them full of non-combustible data. Chalk them so damn full of facts they feel stuffed, but absolutely brilliant with information. Then they'll feel their thinking. They'll get a sense of motion without moving. And they'll be happy, because facts of that sort don't change. Don't give them any slippery stuff like philosophy or sociology to tie things up with. That way lies melancholy. Any man who can take a TV wall apart and put it back together again, and most men can nowadays, is happier than any man who tries to slide rule, measure, and equate the universe, which just won't be measured or equated without making man feel bestial and lonely. I know. I've tried it. To hell with it. So bring on your clubs and parties, your acrobats and magicians, your daredevils, jet cars, motorcycle helicopters, your sex and heroin, more of everything to do with automatic reflex. If the drama is bad, if the film says nothing, if the play is hollow, sting me with the theremin loudly. I'll think I'm responding to the play when it's only a tactile reaction to vibration. But I don't care. I just like solid entertainment. Beatty got up. I must be going. Lecture's over. I hope I've clarified things. The important thing for you to remember, Montag, is we're the happiness boys. The Dixie duo, you and I, and the others. We stand against the small tide of those who want to make everyone unhappy with conflicting theory and thought. We have our fingers in the dike. Hold steady. Don't let the torn of melancholy and drear philosophy drown our world. We depend on you. I don't think you realize how important you are, we are, to our happy world as it stands now. Beatty shook Montag's limp hand. Montag still sat as if the house were collapsing about him, and he could not move in the bed. Mildred had vanished from the door. One last thing, said Beatty. At least once in his career, every fireman gets an itch. What do the books say, he wonders. Oh, to scratch that itch, eh? Well, Montag, take my word for it. I've had to read a few in my time, to know what I was about, and the books say nothing. Nothing you can teach or believe. They're about non-existent people, figments of imagination, if they're fiction. And if they're non-fiction, it's worse. One professor calling another an idiot. One philosopher screaming down another's gullet. All of them running about, putting out the stars and extinguishing the sun. You come away lost. Well, then, what if a fireman accidentally, not really intending anything, takes a book home with him? Montag twitched. The open door looked at him with its great vacant eye. A natural error. Curiosity alone, said Beatty. We don't get over-anxious or mad. We let the fireman keep the book twenty-four hours. If he hasn't burned it by then, we simply come burn it for him. Of course, Montag's mouth was dry. Well, Montag, will you take another later shift today? 
Will we see you tonight, perhaps? I don't know, said Montag. What? Beatty looked faintly surprised. Montag shut his eyes. I'll be in later. Maybe. We'd certainly miss you if you didn't show, said Beatty, putting his pipe in his pocket thoughtfully. I'll never come in again, thought Montag. Get well, and keep well, said Beatty. He turned and went out through the open door. Montag watched through the window as Beatty drove away, in his gleaming yellow flame-colored beetle with the black char-colored tires. And there you have it. Philosophy is too complicated. Ban it. Doesn't make you feel good. Uh, history is too brutal and ugly. Burn it. Or better yet, create a new history, as the left seems to do today. Create an entirely new history that didn't exist, but one that serves your purposes, right? And, uh, oh, by the way, don't read. Don't read your history. Don't read the history books, because you might come up with a version that's different than our version. And let's ban those history books while we're at it, because they disagree with us. In our reality. I would encourage you to uh, pick up your copy of Fahrenheit 451. It's a phenomenal book, and like I said, uh, I think you'll find some interesting parallels between it, its fictional world, and our very real world, uh, right alongside one of my other favorites, which is 1984. And uh, hopefully you'll pick them up in time before they burn them. And they will. And, uh, I just find it funny, you know, like, especially now, people on the left, uh, they, and they've told me, you know, to my face, I've actually had this conversation with people before, they, uh, they say, hey, Dave, you know, we're, we're not like those, those bad people, that, that mustachioed man who marched troops in jackboots, and, uh, shouted a lot in 1930s Germany. Uh, we're not like those people. We're not like that bad man. We don't burn books. Um, to which I would reply, and did reply, um, yes, but don't pretend for a second that you're any better than those people. I mean, think about it. Is the end result not the same? Banning a book versus burning it? You're saying that you are afraid or that you hate or whatever re for whatever reason that you hate the words written on paper. So you're going to ban them from existence. Is this not the same as burning a book? Those men running around in circles in jackboots burning piles of books. Are you not the same as these people? Hmm? The end result is the same. The book doesn't exist anymore. Now, whether you pull it from the shelves or stop it from being printed or you burn it, I don't think it matters. The point is, I don't get to read the book anymore, do I? Because you decided that you don't want anyone to read the book. And let me ask you, who do you think you are? Who are you? To make that choice for everyone. You think you're better than everyone? You think you're better than me? You think you know what's best for me, don't you? What I should read and shouldn't read. And you should be the one to decide that, shouldn't you? Mr. Leftist. Right? That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. And by you trying to pretend like you have some sort of moral high ground because you don't physically burn the books, just makes you a big, fat hypocrite. And a bad person, I might add. <laughs> anyway. Cracks me up, though. Beatty said in the, in the book, um, you know, none of this happened. It wasn't government intervention. The people wanted it, right? The people don't want ugly, boring history. The people don't want astronomical mathematics, you know, 
the concept of a star a billion miles away is just baffling, isn't it? It's just, it's uncomfortable. The fact that we're just a tiny little speck in a big universe. It's uncomfortable. So get rid of it. Read a magazine. Hop on Twitter. Hop on Facebook. Um, retweet. Like. Vote. Downvote. Upvote. Revote. Repost. All these little things, you know, make you feel good, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Makes you feel good, you know? You read all these facts, once again, like the book. You read all these facts, but you don't really learn anything, do you? you read about how much corn they grow in Iowa. You learn about your primary colors. You learn that they're building a road in Switzerland, but you don't have any really fundamental knowledge. You don't really grasp things, right? You know they're building a road, but why are they building a road? Here in California, they're building a bullet train. Why are they building a bullet train? How are they building a bullet train? Did you know they're wasting millions and millions? Actually, at this point, I think it's billions of dollars. They're wasting billions of dollars on this bullet train. Everybody knows they're building the bullet train. Nobody knows anything else about it, though. I do. Because I read. And I know what a horrible waste it is. <sighs> and that's why I drink. So I don't go insane. <laughs> anyway. Like I said, I highly encourage you to pick up your copy before the leftists come for it. And uh, you might find some interesting parallels. But then again, what do I know? I'm just one guy on the internet. And I really don't know that much anyway. <laughs> so. Anyway, that being said, I hope, I hope you have a good night. I hope you have a good weekend. Uh, I hope you read something. I would highly encourage you to uh, read something. And, um, yeah, if you're having a hard time, let me know. Or reach out to somebody, you know. It's not good to be alone. Um, keep you in my thoughts and prayers. If you're having a good time, fantastic. I'll still pray for you because I hope things just will still keep going well for you. So, yeah. I think that about covers it, everyone. <sighs> Take care. And good night.